<laughs> who, who's editing? It's me. <laughs> oh, good times. No, we good thought times. you could do it. <laughs> At the edit, yeah. yeah. You've seen how pro, uh, proficient I am with uh, like the whole tech side of things, <laughs> laptops and whatnot. Yeah, you're a, oh, you're, yeah. So you're a perfect stand-in for Glenn, then. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 49 of Bad Audio, oh no, sorry, not Bad Audio, uh, number one crude mistakes with KJ from Crude But Efficient, Havard from Behind the Mistakes and Glenn from Number One Projects. Unfortunately, Glenn cannot be here this evening, so I will stand in for him. My name is Kev. Hey, great. Hi, guys. Hey, Hi. welcome, Kev. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> That was great. A plus. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much. It took a little while, you know, I had to, you know, ground myself a little bit, get into the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to play, play playing modest there. I mean, this was a one take, so you practiced. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. The online so, persona of Kev Sharkey. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I like most of my stuff is one take because I just couldn't be arsed doing a second one, you know? <laughs> uh, that seems like exactly. work doing a second take. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but editing and whatnot, no. <laughs> one take merchant. But then the question is, since uh, Glenn couldn't bother enough about this podcast to uh, schedule a vacation around the recording, then uh, who is Kev, for those of uh, our listeners who do not know? Oh, yeah. Jesus. Um, that's very... Uh, <laughs> that's very... Um, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Existential. <laughs> <laughs> who am I? It's a, it's a bit it's a bit big headed of me to think that people know who I am. I'm Kev from Shark Attack 1979. I am a carpenter by trade, and I do bits and bobs of making on the side. A bit of leather work, a bit of turning, a bit of carving. I like a little bit of copper work. Uh, I've done some concrete stools and bits and bobs and yeah, I like to make. I'm not a YouTuber though. Sorry, Glenn. I'm not a YouTuber. So I'm not really, not really standing in for, for the man that's missing. Yeah, but you do have an uh, active social media presence uh, in that way. Um yeah, I, I, mean, I, try, you are, I try. You are very much more social on media than I am, at least. <laughs> well, yeah, like I, I do try um, and I try and put stuff on my Instagram. Like I, I kind of only do Instagram um, and yeah, like I've met like all the people I've met through the making, maker community is through Instagram um, and it's something I didn't know existed like until... Like my Instagram was basically following photographers that took nice shots. Um, and then my wife is like, oh, you can do hashtags. And I was like, hashtags. <laughs> uh, so, so I put in hashtag woodworking and I found woodworkers and I was just blown away. Like, um, yeah, they weren't even, some of them weren't even professional. And then I found, yeah, I found the making community. I think kind of one of the first people I was probably started following was probably Andy Pugh. Yeah. Which who you know, KJ. Do you know Andy Havard? Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah. So and then it just kind of spread from there. Um yeah, so it's kind of Instagram is my OG and I suppose I, I follow like now I, I subscribe to a good few YouTube channels, but it wouldn't have been my thing before probably before uh, listening to fools with tools like i knew brett before i knew who jimmy dressed was yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> watching like his I, videos i'm wondering why does his tool say diresta what does that mean <laughs> 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 i think i only started following jimmy because they mentioned him once on fools with tools yeah it was it, it just odd <laughs> and, and why is this guy with a stencil just spraying his name on everything and people is like oh yeah cool <laughs> like <laughs> see a graffiti artist or something oh <laughs> probably is that as well <laughs> yeah but like i as i say like i didn't really know any youtubers or anything until fools of tools stuff so like that was how i found 
the Red Smith and Jimmy Duresta and Brett and yeah. Yeah, it feels sorry. It, fe- it feels ahead. like we had a similar entry to this uh, to this community. But I was thinking, uh, as you said, that, that you were working as a carpenter and then going on to social media and watching people do DIY and I mean people not uh, well different level of proficiency doing the kind of stuff that yeah. you do for work. How is that to have that mixed up with everything else in the in the maker stuff yeah you like so <laughs> i'm very much of the of the ilk that if you know if you don't have something nice to say don't bother saying anything like do you know what i mean yeah. like people the comments can be misconstrued if you try and make a comment to try and give someone a hand with something uh it can definitely be misconstrued as trolling um so like if i see like if I see someone doing something that I wouldn't do, I would try my best to explain how I would do it. That might make it easier for them. But I try, I try my best to be, you know, apologetic uh, w- while I'm saying it. But yeah, like I, like I'm, this, this is <laughs> there's there's a carpentry group that I I I a WhatsApp group that I'm involved in, and they're always giving out about. Uh, this person or that person or how they're doing this or why they're doing this and i'm just like why are you even following them like do you know what i mean <laughs> like why 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 follow that person if, if they're just going to annoy you like you're only following it because it's giving you like it, it's giving you something to give out about basically you know what i mean yeah so yeah like you, you do see some rudimentary errors but like i think more power to people for trying it like do you know what i mean if it's something that i'm doing on a day-to-day basis obviously i had issues at the start with it maybe uh but now i I feel a bit more competent with it but you know i i like i just reckon if anyone can give it a go give it a go do you know what i mean like there's certain things i wouldn't do myself like i wouldn't do i have done a bit of tiling but I i wouldn't do tiling i wouldn't do plumbing I do a little bit of electrics, but I wouldn't go near near a fuse board. Like, but I would try most things in my house. But when it comes to flooding my house, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, <laughs> or like you know, the, there's the, there's reasons that there is reasons that these things are trades, um, and that that's that's maybe it's it's part it's part how I was brought up in the trade that like this guy does that and this guy does that and you do this. But like, there is definitely multi trades out there. But like, most trades are a trade for a reason because there's, you know, there's more to it than you think. Basically, yeah. I think plumbing is one of those. I mean, I I, I dab my toe in a lot of the trades uh, for fun uh, and just to see uh, what I can do on and not uh, in projects. But when it comes to plumbing, although I have a lot of the tools, I'm not doing plumbing. I know what uh what a leak will do to your house if it's uh, left unattended for two days while you're on vacation. So although I feel relatively competent changing out a couple of things, then it's better to pay the professional. And of course, I've had the couple of occasions where people like, I've seen you do this and that. Can you come and have a look at our faucet? It's dripping or something. And then it's like, no, <laughs> I can have a look at it and I can maybe give you input to what you can tell the plumber when you're calling him, but I'm not like, um, <laughs> uh, uh, we had some friends, they needed to change a faucet and I, I'm, I don't want to do it because if it fails, I mean, one thing is if it's my house, but doing it exactly. for a friend and something yeah. fucks up, then um but uh yeah ended up uh they, they had a, a another friend uh, of us who is a plumber but uh she was on sick leave so she couldn't really bend her back but she was like sitting on her knees and pointing me all right you should open that tighten this change it so so i ended up doing the job but i was like uh, guided step by step by a plumber so then i felt <laughs> it's okay <laughs> no that's that's fair and like i have i've changed out sinks and i've changed out taps and do you know what I mean? I do rudimentary stuff, but like I wouldn't get into like heating pipes or do you know what I mean? Like I do it when I have to do it, yeah. but I'm not going to do it just in case. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> just in case. I but speak, I mean, even sorry, I feel kind of 
a confident no not confident but i can i can gamble on it in uh, i mean in tile spaces like the washroom i can do that because okay if there is a leak when it's a tiled floor with a big drain in the middle the water is going to go somewhere but i'm not going to yeah. change the radiator in the living room because yes, that's exactly. just a hassle and that if that goes wrong then everything goes wrong yeah so yeah yeah but and then you get an airlock and then you get you have to try and like flush the system and then yeah no yeah and just just, <laughs> just no, the no. fact that a radiator weighs like half a ton it feels like just lifting it in place and i mean yeah, yeah. it's better to call a professional yeah Mm-hmm. Very much so. Let him pull his back out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's that's another point. You're at that age. That, all right. Let someone else uh, <laughs> ruin their body. <laughs> Pay someone else that's... to ruin their body. That seems... Oh. <laughs> but that, It sounds that... bad when you say it like that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is bad. I mean, no, no, no need to sugarcoat it. Um, but back to the... Um, the social media, of course, I don't bother comment on anyone posting anything that I don't know. And of course, uh, <laughs> not being proficient in any of the trades, uh, I, I'm not even qualified to comment, I feel. But when it comes to the people that I know in the maker community, that's that's half the fun of posting pictures while you're doing stuff because sometimes someone will comment and then they will say all right i see you're doing that um have you tried this or have you tried that and sometimes you have and yeah. but sometimes you actually learn something new so then i i i appreciate the feedback uh, from other makers on what i'm doing because it it keeps feeding me new stuff to learn all the time and uh, I also try to do the same thing, uh, not uh, wording myself in a way that I'm trying to <laughs> uh, yeah, pretend exactly. that I know what I'm talking about. But I can say, I did that once and I fucked up this way. So uh, that's uh, <laughs> try not to do that at least. <laughs> I do that sometimes when I like, if I've made a mistake, I try and post it. And I'm like, the hashtag is like, learn by my mistakes. Do you know what I mean? So, like, especially uh, in work or whatever, um, I was, uh, a little while ago, I was, uh, we were lifting a floor in an extension because we were re we extended the extension. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the client didn't have enough money to do a big extension initially, so we had to go back and do a second extension then after we'd finished lifting the floor. Uh, I had my saw set for the depth of the plywood, like 18 mil, just, just below, and then I went and cut out a stud, like a four by two stud, so like a 50 mil stud or whatever. So I set my saw again and then I went back cutting the floor and straight through to heating pipes. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was, it was, um, uh, it was a pressurized system as well. Ooh. So the water hit the ceiling. It went everywhere. You, you knew oh. it directly at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I had to switch everything off, try and like l- let let it die down a bit, and then lift up the rest of the ply because it was like it was a fountain in the middle of the floor. Like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I posted that and said, "Look, learn by my mistakes, people. Learn by my mistakes. It's not the first, and it won't be the last, I'm sure. But you know, I try, I try and remember." <laughs> And that's when you realize you're very happy for the, <laughs> like the fail safe insurance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I look at we, I was lucky enough that it was in the part of the extension we were pulling apart. Uh, we were like, the, it was basically, yeah, we were putting in new floor. We were putting in, uh, we had to move the heat and pipes anyway. So like there was, there was a lot of things going my way. It wasn't a finished house. If you know what I mean? We had a kind of, we had a, a plywood door blocking off the rest of the house and they'd set up their kitchen upstairs. And yeah, like there was a lot of things going my way, but it still didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> no. So even when the client came along and said, it's okay, Kev, don't worry about it. I was like, it's not okay. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm at this 20 years. I should know better. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. It's one way to feel like an absolute dickhead. <laughs> yeah. 
And then hopefully a few days later, you might feel on top of the world because you, you pull off something <laughs> the first try that you did yeah. not ex- <laughs> expect. So, yeah. It does happen. I think with, well, with my job, especially, like, you get a bit complacent, um, you know, like using tools, and then you need a little near miss to just bring you back to reality. Yeah, and say, reality like, check. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because like for for my, most of my career, I was using like a one ten, um, like an eight inch, uh, one ten volt skill saw. So like I would have cut that. That was my only saw, um, and then I started getting battery stuff. Like, so I had a battery skill saw. It was the first like first month, maybe two months using it, and I was just wielding it around like it was it was nothing. And I said to one of the lads, <laughs> as I was uh, scalloping out the bottom of a board with the skill saw, like I said, "Yeah, it's mad. Like, you, there's no weight in it. Like, and you you forget you forget it's a, a an actual tool. Like, it's more like a toy. And then, like ten ten seconds later, uh, my finger hits off the blade. Like, uh, I was wearing gloves. Didn't do massive damage, but I was like, "You fucking idiot! Like, <laughs> what an absolute dope." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it just takes a second, and yeah, 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 yeah. It's... You need you need those near misses just to make sure you keep all your fingers. <laughs> and and there is there is a third one there that I got to think about. That it gives you that same feeling, although nothing went wrong. Um, uh, I'll give an example. My 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 father ran a, a computer company, and of course uh, we were fixing uh, computers and uh, building them and so on for customers. And this one customer came in, and he had a broken hard drive, which he could not access. And uh, it was uh, actually he had dropped it or or something. So one of the tabs on the data connection cable has come loose from the circuit board, and I just looked at it and. I think I was like 15 at the time and it's like, I can weld the, no, I, I can solder that because uh, I've done a lot of soldering uh, on different things, learned from my dad and of course uh, set it up and uh, the client was standing just over my shoulder watching and I was like soldering it and he thought I was a professional. Uh, to be honest, I haven't, I mean, I've soldered a lot, but not at that level. And of course I pulled it off very pleased we plugged it in all right you you, we could read it so he could bring it back home and use it and he was happy and my father came in and like so what's been happening here well a client was in and uh, i just showed him and i I sold the disc you did what (laughs) and it's like the reaction when you say you did what you understood that you did something that could have really gone wrong but you got so lucky just pulling it off so of course it was a good story but you realized afterwards I should, really shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's basically the same feeling, like with the saw that you, you you're doing something dodgy and you almost cut your hand off, but you get so lucky and it's like, oh my god, I need to go in and sit down for a bit. It's that same feeling, <laughs> like the reality check. <laughs> yeah, nothing like a dad to bring you back down to earth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I just be reminded that you're stupid. Uh, when I was working as a service technician at an arcade hall, and I was going to fix, I don't remember, even remember what it was going to fix on a machine, but it's I had to go all the way behind a lot of machines. So it was like seven or eight machines I had to go go behind. And, oh, yeah, I was supposed to, to, to pull the plug uh, to turn it off, but you did from the front. Oh, I can't be bothered to go out. I just fix it while it's plugged in. And I was just taking the back panel uh-huh. off, and then I felt sh- some kind of short circuit through my body. And I felt like, okay, I'm not going to die here. This is so <laughs> bloody stupid. So I tore myself <laughs> free from it because, I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't a deadly uh, voltage, but it was enough to give a a to big tingle, <laughs> and I just <laughs> felt so goddamn stupid because he was just lazy, not going all the way around to turn it off. I can do this. It's yeah. it's not it's not gonna be a big thing. This, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm, find a body behind the arcade machines. I have to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm gonna. I'm gonna do two things here. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cement the <laughs> the fact that I'm getting old, and uh, 
I'm going to reveal a secret from the bedroom. Um, a, cu- <laughs> a couple of years ago, my wife and I, we uh, realized that, I mean, it was uh, in the pandemic, uh, the, the prices on electric- electricity was really high. So like, instead of having the heat on, uh, of course, in the daytime, we can keep the temperature low, uh, but uh, in the nighttime, maybe... Maybe you should try one of those heating blankets. And my wife then got to borrow one from her aunt that she has been had laying around from the 70s or whatnot, a real old relic. And of course, wow. yeah, that, that heating blanket. Of course, I, I tried it when my wife uh, wasn't in bed and I was like, this is really nice. I'm getting one. So we ended up having one each. And these are... It's it's the kind of socket. They're not grounded, to say that. So, of course, me and my wife were laying in bed. We had each our heating blanket plugged in, uh, different sockets in the room. Uh, I still think it's the same circuit, and if that matters or not, I do not know. But then I just grazed my wife with my elbow, and once I did, you feel that resistance that you feel if you have like a a ground fault in an electrical equipment where you drag your finger and you feel that kind of resistance, uh, short circuit, something. And it's like, this can't be good. <laughs> and uh, of course we swapped out the old one and got a new one there as well, but it's, it's still the same. So there is something with this uh, unearthed uh, heating blankets that uh, it, it brings electricity back in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the spark alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I have an electric one. It was uh it wasn't me though. Uh my mate Steve that I work with. So I've been working with Steve for about twelve years now. He's my foreman. But um he was trimming for our old boss, he was trimming some hedges uh with the boss's new uh hedge trimmer. And my boss is like, now make sure you look after that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And he's trimming away. And someone beeps a horn on the on the main road. And he turns to look. And the hedge trimmer goes straight through the lead. So he he's like, oh, fuck, I have to finish this hedge. So he um, takes the end that's connected to the trimmer. And he cuts around it with his knife. And he pulls the plastic off with his teeth. And... Uh, and because he's going to put he's going to uh, put like a connector block on it just to get the head trimming done and then he goes and puts his knife to the other end and boom <laughs> <laughs> so the cut was so clean the two cables didn't touch and the, the or uh, RCB never tripped in the house so the trip switch never went because the cut was so clean it was still live on that end and he hadn't unplugged it like so like he took a hole a hole out of his sandy blade like and nearly crapped himself because he's about to stick it in his mouth to pull the plastic off uh, fucking hell I, I, I learned <laughs> this the hard way uh, my parents house were relatively new and they had some upgrades so from i was a kid they had all the switches in their house was double switches so they broke both the leads of any cable uh which is which is nice so you just hit the switch and you could actually just work on them without the tripping the breakers then we bought this house which was built in uh, the early 60s and all the switches just break the uh, the live lead, but the other one is very much still live towards ground. Uh. And all the cables do have also these. Um, is it conduits? You call them the the pipes which you you yeah. route the cables through. Yeah, it's it's metal conduits all through the house. Oh no! So of course, <laughs> so I was going to change some lights and so on in the living room just after we bought the house. So just all right, turn the switch off. All right. The lights off, and then I just uh, unscrewed the connection block and uh, started th- working on it. And then one of the wires, I touched one of the wires, and then I also touched the metal conduit. So I then short circuit that, and it really struck my fingers. And it's like, holy shit, there's still power here. And I thought something was <laughs> wrong. Uh, and then when I started just checking, and all right, I. I deduced uh, <laughs> my way to all right. There's still one live here, and then unscrewed the uh, the switch and realized all right, this just breaks one of the the wires. So uh, I learned that the hard way. 
<laughs> yeah, yes, trial by fire. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, when we moved into this house, I was renovating it before we moved in. Uh, we had like a month to do it. So the plan was just to, just to tart it up, like make it livable. Um, and there was a wall with a socket in the middle of it and a radiator and I had the plumber in. The plumber's going to move the radiator pipes and I got the electrician in and I said, um, yeah, can you, I just want that socket moved over to here. And maybe stick in a few more sockets. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then he went out to the Mephuse board and came back in and said, I hate to tell you this, mate. He's like, none of your house is earthed. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, no, none of your house is earthed. So I had to run new cable to all the sockets in the house uh, and try and get the place tarted up before we moved in <laughs> so that was great fun chasing concrete walls uh putting in uh back boxes um yeah running cables through the whole place oh fun times fun times <laughs> we had the house just keeps giving we had to do much the same and of course originally all the cables was outside on the walls and we realized we don't mind so we're doing that we're not the uh, putting them inside the walls and uh, doing that additional work. But here as well, all the uh, cables for the sockets were unearthed. Um, so when we moved in, we had uh, an electrical company to do the first floor. Um, at least the, the wires that were exposed. And uh, then, of course, you know, we started renovating some of the walls and there was some brick work and they made like these... Uh, cut out shelves in the brick wall where you could put knickknacks and so on and we didn't think that was very aesthetically pleasing with the rest so i just knocked out the back walls and i realized that at some point <laughs> there were wires to some electrical appliance on or around that wall at some point and then when the previous owner wanted to just break it up and uh, make the the shelves or, or whatnot he just he just cut the cables uh dead center in the wall the and just well no they they weren't live anymore but it just plastered up that wall and so when we took everything down it's just an exposed wire there and of course i have a multimeter so the first thing i was like all right this one is proper dead but of course, it, it's in the concrete wall, and I don't know where the other end is. And I, I don't, <sighs> of course, and I started looking for it. And then, of course, there were some uh, uh, conduit boxes with some old clamps. And it, it was the twist clamps where they just put the wires together. And I had it was a rat's nest and trying to figure out what was live and not and what was connected to what. I tried to taking one of them loose, and then we lost uh, all power in the kitchen. It's like, do all the appliances go through this uh, two and a half square centimeter cable? Doesn't seem right. And it was probably right at some time, but I mean, we have a lot more appliances these days. We, they are drawing a lot more power. Yeah. And yeah, we just realized we have to do everything. So once we did the bathroom, we also called the, another electrical company and said, change the fuse box and all the wires out of it that wasn't done uh, the first time when you moved in because it's a fire hazard i don't know what other cables are just cut inside the walls live not yeah. live anything so it's like cut everything out the fuse box put in a new and new wires and everything else just leave it dead so uh <laughs> jesus and was so you you have everything surface mounted everything's in conduit running running up the walls down to sockets and whatnot yeah Except, um, I mean, the, the switches for the the roof lights and so on, those are inside the walls and uh, metal conduits. Yeah. And the the positive thing with this house is that the, the fuse box was in the loft. I mean, they, they wouldn't place, a, uh, place it in the loft today Jesus. because the access is crappy. Yeah. But that means that all yeah. the conduits and everything go up in pipes that meet at a central point in the loft. So, of course, the, oh. the electrical company said, we'll move the new fuse box down in your hallway where it's easy accessible and everything, but we'll run the wires up. 
and your old fuse box cabinet will be like a, a bus bar mounting cabinet. So every cable from the fuse cabinet end up in that other cabinet in the attic and everything is marked and they go straight down to all the rooms. And since every room has a separate metal conduit, they say it's very easy for you to put in a fuse for every room in the house and you have full control of uh, what you want to go where. So, I mean, logistically, it's very nice. And uh, yeah. in, in some of these old metal conduits, they use grease to get the cables through. Oh, okay, and yeah. that, of course, after 30, 40 years, that becomes really hard and crappy. But they, they didn't use that here. So, I mean, it just... They just pulled new wires through with ease. I mean, in, in two days, they swapped everything out, and it, it's really good. So there's one thing they did Jesus. right in the 60s. <laughs> that's that's great. Like, yeah, you'd be looking at a couple of weeks, I think, to run them in Irish houses. Easy, like. But that, And then plastering. and. But it, it, and, it's a funny thing, and I, that's maybe the, the greatest takeaway I learned from buying a house. Me and my wife, we went here, looked at the house, and I was immediately sold because the previous owner, he had a workshop in his cellar, and all the tools were on the wall, and they had their specific place. He has marked uh, like the, the contours of all the tools and everything, and I thought, well, someone who has so many tools, although they were old, they were none of them were missing, and I mean... This is a good sign. This is a guy that takes care of his tools. I mean, the house should be solid, and we bought the house, and I learned the hard way that having a good tool collection doesn't make you a, a good house owner. So we have the tool we have found does not make the man <laughs> exactly. So we we found a lot of uh, solutions that I, I necessarily wouldn't do them, but then again. If I had done it my way, a tradesman would probably say, what a dickhead. But <laughs> it is what well, it is. My house was owned by a builder before I moved in. <laughs> so you think, oh, a builder. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Isn't that the, the cobbler's shoes or uh, something like that? Yeah. <laughs> cobbler's children yeah. go around barefoot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus, lads. I tell you, this house has stories to tell. There was a lot of effing and blinding as I was going around going, why the fuck did you do that? <laughs> why? Why? But but the good thing with having a house that they've been very creative with some solutions is that you feel that you're making upgrades. Everything you do, even if you do a mediocre job, it's better than it was before. So Exactly. It's true. And I think I, I definitely, like, I'm pretty hard on this guy, but like, this house was built in the seventies. I think he had like six kids or something like that. <laughs> um, and he was running a building company. Like, so, you know, yeah, I think, and I think also there was less, like there's definitely more building regulations in now since, since when I started yeah. built, like working in the building trade as well. Like, so, you know, what's commonplace now probably wasn't commonplace then as well. Like, but still, some of it's just like some of it's just laziness but basically but that that's a good thing in um, i mean depending on who, who you're asking of course i think it's a good thing we have relatively strict building codes in norway and they are uh, we, we have a, a semi-national research facility as well who is the owner of the building codes and any change needs to be, um, of course, compliant with every other international uh, and European uh, legislation for whatnot, but everything should be tested to work uh, before it's allowed to be used when you're building a new house. And a lot of the house building techniques in Norway are made out of, we had a lot of wood, so all the houses are in wood. And of course, it is a lot of bad weather, a lot of temperature fluctuations. So even this house in the 60s, it's built out of sturdy materials. It has, although the materials are old, it's it has the right philosophy with regards to vapor barrier and so on. So I changed a few boards here. We put in a new door and I get to see the 
the studs and framework uh, of the house and it looks like someone put it up yesterday and it's so it's rock, rock yeah. solid and and that's a good thing so i'm not afraid of that and of course everything else the the panels and the the decor if you could call it that is dated but me and my wife has also come to that conclusion i mean it's it's an old house uh, it has charm and as kj say whatever you do is an upgrade but we don't want a show pony for a house. We don't want to spend uh, a, a million on making it look like a brand new funk house or something like many others. So we, real, we realized it's a sturdy house. We just do what is necessary for maintenance and for practicalities. And we have a relatively cheap house that we are not too yeah. afraid of it's like your car after a couple of years and you've dinged it a couple of times you're not afraid of it anymore you're just using it and it's the same with our house so uh yeah yeah it has to be lived in especially when you've got kids like yeah uh my my wife would be very much into aesthetics though so like she wants things to look a certain way but like i i suppose like she's she's the creative herself and she's very arty so she would have a certain vision, um, you know. I, I get it, like, but it still has to be functional. I'm more, I'm more form over function, or function over form, and she's she's form over function, you know. Yeah, and I like my. It's the same with my wife as well, I, and and I I think we have started to probably rub off on each other. So I think we have a common understanding of what aesthetics we want. In the house we're gonna build when we're pensioners because you have done that realization. <laughs> I mean, yeah. should we change out those seventies cardboard doors in our house? No, because it's, they're gonna be full of stickers and crayons and <laughs> and of course realizing that and saying we're not gonna do this in this, this house. We're gonna keep those old doors. And you, yes, you have to retight the screws every four weeks because the handles almost fall off, but the kids can do whatever they want. Uh, they are putting things up, uh, driving nails into them to put up pictures and it's like, go ahead, go <laughs> ahead. And it, it really takes the, the edge off. <laughs> yeah. My kids are getting that little bit older that, yeah, we're starting to, you know, put a bit of effort in, like we put in a new kitchen last you no, no, not last year. Jesus, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we did bathrooms last year. I'm redoing another bathroom at the moment. New doors, paneling everywhere. Yeah, so they're past the kind of drawn on wall stage, but they still have their moments of swinging out of doors and slamming doors. And What age are they? Uh, my eldest will be 14 November and my youngest is 10 since July. Okay, so is it... So they're getting... It's not so, yeah. not so much crayons, but maybe wild parties and, and teenage horm hormones exactly. instead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe that's on the way instead. Yeah. <laughs> but that... that... But we, we live with... Oh, sorry, go on. Well, that, that being said, uh, having old doors, I'm not afraid to modify them. And we have two girls and slamming doors is already a thing. They are four and six. And I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go to Ikea. I'm going to get these shelves dampers and I'm going to mount those. So when they get to the teenage stage where they want to slam the door, good luck doing that. It's a soft <laughs> close. Soft close. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, <laughs> try and slam it now. <laughs> My six-year-old will be so pissed if the doors wouldn't slam when he's angry. So I I've wonder what he would do then. <laughs> I've taken them up off the hinges. I mean, they they've had visitors over and they really don't listen to you and they're slamming the doors. And after the five or six time I've said, please don't slam the doors and they just keep doing it. I just go in and I just lift it off the hinges and put it up against the wall. Good, good luck slamming a door that's not there. And of course my, my girls are used to it, but uh, when we have new visitors over, it's like, he came in and took the door off. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> 
Yeah, um, but the the doors over here don't really work that way. Like they're four inch butt hinges, nah. <laughs> so they don't lift off. You know, um, but I like that idea. I do like that idea. <laughs> you can't slam it now. <laughs> it's out the back garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the other thing with an old house. I mean the they have in place built cabinets. And of course, with the old uh, wafer thin <clears throat> paper mache doors with the, the hinges that break and twist and so on. And I mean, it, it keeps falling off uh, in my daughter's uh, room and it's like, oh, I'm so tired. I bought some new hinges to match the old ones, screw them in. But I mean, it's it's the same old design, so it doesn't really work. So at some point it had fallen Your off doors? and I just I opened the window and I just took it off the hinges and just tossed it out the window because Sam because you throw it in the trailer and <laughs> put it in the trash and my daughter is like you just threw it out <laughs> yep <laughs> we, we're not having a door anymore and uh, I mean <laughs> when we are redoing the uh, the room uh, we're gonna knock down the I mean the built, in. The built in and actually put in some uh, Ikea cabinets or something like that so uh yeah, there's a lot to be said for IKEA lads. A lot to be said for it. Like you know, you give you hear people giving out about IKEA, but I mean, it's uh, if you were to try and make that for the price it's costing you, there's not a fucking hope. Exactly, and that's not going to be heirloom. Yeah, yeah, definitely not going to be heirloom. And just the time savings of it. I need a bookshelf. Yeah, I go and buy it, and I put it up, and it's there. Yeah, that's worth so much, especially when you have kids, because yeah, it, it would be nice to make your own furniture and make everything fit perfectly and be custom made. But then a bookshelf would take at least six months and then <laughs> yeah. never get anywhere. Only six months you show off. <laughs> yeah. Six months and hundred thousand dollars in oak. <laughs> yeah. And tools. Oh, I need this new tool <laughs> as well. Just to... <laughs> Oh, that's uh, I got a message here uh, on the the WhatsApp chat, <laughs> and the question was: I get a heavy package delivered. How do I most efficiently get it through the door? Uh, and I didn't order delivery <laughs> in place. And there was a lot of creative solution. And it turns out the tool in question was a hundred and sixty kilogram. Uh, like a, a planar thicknesser with a helical head. And it's like, <laughs> I've been drooling on those for years. And yeah, it's on sale. Oh, I mean, yeah, I've seen them at this company. Yeah, it's that company. And I was like going on the web page. Yeah, that, that's the one I've stored as a, a shortcut on my web browser. It's on sale. And it's like, but I don't have room for one. <laughs> but yeah, the, the constant need of new tools. Um, yeah. It is like you. Well, you, I think both your workshops are bigger than mine, but like, yeah, just space, yeah. space and condoning the spending. I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> it's the problem for me. Yeah, you always fill out the space, no matter how much you have. And I mean, I have What's... I have a long list of tools I would like to have, but and and having some some other tool jump that queue feels so wrong because i more i need so many other stuff more than all those that would yeah. be nice to have yeah i know the feeling like when i so my van got broken into about probably eight years ago now and i had just gotten to the point where i was buying tools that i didn't necessarily need but i kind of wanted so like i just got myself a biscuit jointer which i kind of wouldn't use very often but you know, it was just nice to have. And then my van got broken into and all my tools got stolen. And I was like, <laughs> it was horrible, horrible feeling. But yeah, there's like, obviously I use the tools every day. So it's like a toss up between, I need this for the workshop, but I kind of need this for work. And then, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard, hard to condone the spending. Yeah, I've seen a lot of videos, though, uh, at least from uh, the mainland UK, where uh, I mean, 
tradesmen's uh, I mean, uh, vans are relatively often broken into. I haven't heard that being a very large problem in Scandinavia, but I'm guess it's it's coming here as well. But uh, yeah, having, I mean, my workshop is just a bit larger than a, a decent sized van. So I'm, I'm guessing it's a lot of the same tools as well. And having all of them stolen overnight, I mean, it's one thing is the yeah. just the loss of all your tools, but also it's your trade. So I actually need those <laughs> and, and having to go and replace them. And I, you probably also spend years like honing them and figure out where they are without maybe reflecting on it like yeah. everything all at once and then you're faced with the problem I, I need to buy everything now new and what what did i have what do i need first where do i go like <laughs> you probably end up with a lot of questions you didn't need on top of that yeah so like it was it was a matter of what do i need what can i not do without and like i built up that like I was, I think I was 14 years at, at that stage and the guy I was working for had a lot of tools, but you had to kind of wait for him to arrive to site. So I started picking up bits and bobs here and there and, you know, I, I built it up, built it up, built it up. Um, but yeah, it was, that was like, where do I start? What do I get first? What can I afford? Do you know that sort of way? Um, what am I going to be doing next? Do I need that now? Do I not need that? Like... Yeah, but they they took like everything. I like I I had my I just got a new eighteen volt gear, so that was in with me. Uh, but everything else they took, like uh, track saw, uh, nail gun, pinner, planer, uh, chop saw, like miter saw, um, drills, uh, biscuit jointer. Oh, it was. It was harrowing. <laughs> it was harrowing. <laughs> yeah, that's where all the tools on the uh, auction sites come from. <laughs> Sto- exactly. Stolen so, like, hands. it's not just the guys robbing the tools; it's the people that are buying those tools. Is the is the problem? Yeah. And the question is, I mean, given the fact that uh, we talked about the maker community, and you have the the six degrees of separation. And I think in the maker community, it's max three degrees of separation. I mean, uh, if you go two guys, you you probably uh, could talk to anyone. And <laughs> realizing that yeah. you, you probably know someone who has bought uh, one of your tools at an auction site. Like, <laughs> I got this. It was a bloody good deal. I bet it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's hardly That's been used. On the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, it's funny. It's like, because the tools, I think, from Ireland were going to the UK and the tools from the UK were going to Ireland yeah, and probably. just being sold at, like, markets, you know? But that's the thing, though. Of course, I, I sit on online marketplaces looking at tools a lot of the times, and some of them are like, this is suspiciously cheap. Either something <laughs> is wrong with it or it is stolen. And then, of course, you, you, you send an email and the person he answers really quick and he's really like in a hurry to get rid of it. And like, okay, so yeah, he's, no, no, in, take it, he's take in a hurry. It. Nothing seems wrong with it. And it's very cheap. Yeah, it's stolen. And then, of course, it's Definitely. like, but I can't really afford buy it new. And it's already stolen the guy who owned it he probably has a new one now and gotten over it i mean mean, at least the tool will come to someone who loves it and treat it well and it's like you're building all that scenario yeah but i'd be happy for it to go to someone you know like yourself that would that would appreciate it you know but the problem is i don't know it just it's the p it's like it's not even you know, if if my tools got sold sold to a young apprentice coming up, who you know who didn't have a lot of money and he needs to get started, that's fair. Just those horrible, horrible people that took the tools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you just know that they were sold for like not not near what they were worth? <laughs> you know, especially to me. Yeah, that's the annoying part. Like whatever monetary value was what they were initially, they were definitely worth a lot. Like whatever money they made out of it, like they're definitely worth a lot more to me. 
Yeah. But we cannot dwell and live in the past. <laughs> True that. Maybe that's a, that's a good segue for the half pint because I have uh, <laughs> I have uh, two words, broken tools, uh, <laughs> oh. which is only suitable for half pint, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds great. So then we say bye bye for for this episode and see you in the half pint on Tuesday. Bye. 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 bye.